both tagged. We're on the spotlight. So I think we are ready to go and let me kick it off by just welcoming you to Virtual Book Club, Sabrina. It's been a while since our group has seen you. Yes. Uh, actually, I don't know if I've ever done this group, but uh, I know I've been with Fresh Fiction uh, events, other events. So. Yes. Uh, can you hear me okay? I can hear you great. Yes. Okay. Because mm -hmm. because I have my special headphones, I have the special mic, and I'm always worried that it's not working on the one I'm on. So, okay. The joys of technology, right? Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Exactly. And by the way, I am not in bed. I know the pillow makes it look like I am, but this is actually the pillow I use in my office to support my back and all that stuff. Anyway. We completely understand you. We want you to be comfortable. So, you know, proper posture while you're in your writing chair is very important. So yes, it is. we can go with that. <laughs> Now, and I'm glad us, you get, I get, I'm glad you got the memo too, that you course. and I were to wear the same color. Yes. Know. Now yeah. I have to admit and kind of get into this a little bit later too. I was tempted to wear some of my Tulane t-shirts oh, yeah. <laughs> because we're fellow alumna from Tulane. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I never went to a single game. I don't think, but I was, oh, never they, were, they were never really good football teams. So that I, was, okay. I was a graduate student. So we were, we never went to games. We just tried to keep our heads above water. And I made the mistake my first year at Tulane, my, as a grad student that I signed up for, I, I had to go, I had four grad graduate classes because I was a fellowship student the first year. So I didn't have to do any teaching. I signed up for four novel classes. So that was four novels a week, which for a lot of us reading romance would not be a big deal. But for when the novels were things like James Joyce's Ulysses and Thomas Pynchon's uh, Gravity's Rainbow and things like that. Yeah, by the last week, I had four novels to read and I didn't read any of them. I'm like, I just can't do it anymore. <laughs> anyway, so. Yeah, it's important that the novels that we're reading are things that we actively enjoy. Yes. Right. That's very yeah. important. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it does get a bit heavy there. <laughs> mm -hmm. Tell me about it. Now, some of us are longtime readers of yours. But there, we also have some members here who are new to you. So can you tell us a little bit about Sabrina Jeffries and the books that you write? Okay, my, I write historical romance. Um, I, I started out writing as Deborah Martin and my books were heavier and were set in uh, the restoration period and well, Wales and any place I thought was different. I think that came out of my academic background. But the fact of the matter is, I fell in love with romance reading Barbara Cartland in high school. Yes, I, I, uh, I was overseas and it was hard to get uh, books in English um, because we were in, in Thailand or Siam as people used to know it. And um, I read, so I discovered Barbara Cartland and went, these are the best thing ever and read them like they were paper, you know, like they were um, uh, potato chips. I mean, it was just like, but unfortunately it was hard to find them. So a few years back, they had Barbara Cartland's whole like past, uh, of, I guess you could say, they couldn't have all of them because she wrote, I don't know, 300 books or something, but they had them at Walmart. They were selling them with the original covers that were on them when I was a kid, wow. when I was in high school. And I remember walking into Walmart, they had a display and my instant reaction was, oh, it's Margaret Cartland. And then I went, you don't even read her anymore. You haven't read her in years. What is wrong with you? But it was that high school, 
it's the author I love. There's her books. And they're all those books I love. So the Regency- I pulled a lot of those down when I first saw them on ebook. So I've got a small collection of hers on my Kindle for the exact yeah. same reasons. I get yes, it. Yes, it. it was just, you know, and uh, so it, it made a big impression on me. And then when I went to, anyway, I guess you didn't, that's not what you asked. So what I write, I was very in, influenced by Regency for that reason. Uh, I read later, I liked, you know, Judith McNaught and Joanna Lindsay's Mallory series. Well, I liked all of Joanna Lindsay's books, but what resonated for me in all of the books, maybe not so much Barbara Carton because it's been a long time, so I don't remember, but um, I discovered I really liked humor in romance. So I started writing, uh, when I was writing as Deborah Martin and I was writing all this kind of very heavy stuff, my critique partner was Rexanne Becknell and she said, what do you like to read? which you would think she would have known that, but she didn't appear. <laughs> I don't know. I said, Regency romance. And she said, why aren't you writing that? Mm -hmm. And I said, because there's a lot of research. And she said, you have a PhD. You know how to do research. I said, yeah, that's true. So um, anyway, that's how I started out write, writing uh, Regency romance. And I kind of had to fight with, I think it was a very good experience for me writing, deciding that I wanted to write humor because, well, I have a very funny family. My brothers are really funny. My dad was always cracking jokes. Even my mother has had her moments and my sisters, everybody in my family's funny. And, um, but I had never tried to write humor and but I had written um, my a little bit of humor, I think, in my in my contemporary uh, paranormal romantic suspense books, and yeah, I have three of those. But I and those had gotten a lot more attention than all my Deborah Martin books, and so I thought, what was it about that? What was it about my voice? I need to really figure out what I'm doing here. And so I wrote my pirate, I wrote the pirate Lord and that was uh, going to be my pirate book. And I just let my voice be my voice, my regular talking voice, rather than some deep historical voice that I thought I should write. And then that's what happened. It just, it, then I think the real me came out. And at first it was hard because I would try to write and I would write as Deborah Martin and I would send this stuff to Roxanne and she's like, this is Deborah Martin. Where is Sabrina Jeffries? And I would be like, I don't know. I haven't found her yet. <laughs> but, but I had to just sit there and say, no, stop trying to be something. Just be yourself. Just be yourself. Yes, the, the tone is going to be too modern, but you can fix that later. So that's, but that's, that's how it started. So I feel like I write humorous books. I think my husband would call them droll. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not a, um, he's very cynical in general and he's very critical of comedy. So he doesn't think my brothers are funny at all. And I'm like, okay, fine. But they're, they're not professional comedians. It's true. <laughs> they're just making jokes, you know, but um, uh, I, so I started writing that way. And then along the way, I, I tried to put more of the things I think and believe and, and whatever in the books. And, but I, I, for me, it was all about, you know, the, the things that I loved about Barbara Cartland. That's really, it goes back to what I loved about Judith McNaught and what I loved about Joanna Lindsay. And, you know, since then, I remember reading Megan McKinney. She was in our chapter and I read her for the first time. And I had read a lot of the, um, what they call now bodice rippers, which we 
considered an insult back then, but is no longer an insult is an affectionate term, which I'm still getting used to. And I read a lot of bodice rippers um, in college and they were my, uh, you know, kind of secret. I don't want to say guilty pleasure because I don't believe we should have guilt. There's nothing we should feel guilty about. These are perfectly acceptable books. But at this point, I was going to a Baptist college. So I did kind of (laughs) hide the very lurid covers and all that. But I... um, I, I really um, start, so, so I came back to romance and read after grad school and I read um, a bunch of books. And then I read, I remember reading Megan McKinney after having read a bunch of, uh, you know, when I was younger, um, Rosemary Rogers and, and those kind of books, you know, Kathleen Woodowis. And Although I don't think anybody would say this about Megan McKinney's book, but for me, my reaction was the heroes aren't mean. They're not mean. They're not bullying the heroine. They're not, you know, now I think most readers now would consider her heroes to be more old school. But for me, there was a marked difference between Rosemary Rogers and Megan McKinney. And that was something I could, I could do. That was something I wanted to do. So that was why um, I, I looked at all the Regency authors that I knew and, and then tried to find my own voice is mm-hmm. what I did. Well, how do the stories come to you? Because that's one of the things that is so appealing to me with your stories is that all of your Sabrina Jeffries works have that humor in them. And even starting off again with The Duke for Diana, that was what jumped out at me instantly. And and I wouldn't call them droll. I was thinking it's more like the witty repartee between the characters. (laughs) And instantly it's like, oh, I love Diana and I love The Duke. And it's like, okay, chapter one. And it's like, I'm already ready for them to get together. And you know that there's all this stuff. So the banter back and forth just jumps out always. So is that... Are those conversations coming to you or is it the character? Yeah, when it, when I um, I go back and forth, as y'all know, sometimes I do mysteries and a mystery arc over the books, over the, a series of books like Hellions. I had, you know, they only find out the parent, you know, who killed, uh, what happened with the parents I, uh, at, at the last book. And I did that with my last series, which was Duke Dynasty. And so I think the humor was there, but but whenever you have the mystery, that also has a part. And so it takes, so when I started writing a Duke for Diana, it was like, I've missed this. I haven't had anything where I had to think, where I had that hamper of the mystery. Now, I will say that there are readers who missed that. They wanted that and didn't have that. And then there were readers who really liked that it was just pure, you know, fun. So, so, and the people who thought it was boring, I figure they didn't see, they didn't, they didn't want just witty repartee. They wanted this, that, and the other. And so you're never going to please every reader. My, my agent keeps saying you have to Stamp, st- staple that to your head, stamp it on your head. Um, it's like, I know, but I want to please all the readers. <laughs> it's like, cannot be done. And that's true. It cannot be done. And I know that intellectually, I know that, but you know, you still want to do it. Of course, why not? Um, so uh, yeah, for me, it's, it, it, it just, it does come from something natural and um, I've always thought of myself as not being funny. And then one day I was thinking, you know, I, I told my, my other critique partner, who is Deb Marlowe, I told her, I said, was, that, was it just boring? Was it all boring? And she laughed and said, no, it wasn't boring. It was, what, what do you mean? Of course it wasn't boring. I'm like, because it seemed really boring to me because there wasn't enough happening, you know? 
And, and then it dawned on me, every time I talked to her, she laughs a lot. And I thought, maybe I am funny. I don't think I am, but anyway. So maybe it's because, well, I always consider it at a successful conversation with my husband if I make him laugh because he's a hard, harsh critic. And particularly with my father, my father has dementia and he is in a nursing home and he's in the final stages of dementia. So a lot of times he doesn't know who I am, but he still loves to laugh. And if I can make my dad laugh, then I feel like That's I have counter. succeed. I have done something because he loved to laugh. He was always, you know, funny and liked to hear, to, to listen to people who were funny and my brothers would get going and they would riff off each other. And my dad would just be laughing and my mom would be laughing. And so I, you know, I feel like if I can just make him less, I'm not as quick witted as my brothers. For me, it comes, it's, it's a little harder coming. Like I'll write it and then I'll go back and read it and go, oh, I could have put this, you know, and I'll, and I'll edit it. So some of it comes from editing. But a lot of it is just if I can just let go and let the flow, it's hard because I'm a plotter. So mm -hmm. I plot everything down to the last. I, um, a friend of mine, uh, the late Claudia Dane, I don't know if any of y'all knew that she had passed away, but she passed away um, last year. And um, we did a talk together and we were talking about plotting and I started talking about swimming and how when I, it was hard for me because I like to swim and plot, but the problem was I had this, I did two, uh, I would do two, two lengths of one stroke and then I do two lengths of another stroke and then, and thinking about which stroke I was going to do next would keep me from letting myself plot while I was swimming. And she said, oh my God, you plot your swimming. I can't believe it. <laughs> and I went, yeah, I guess I do. And so, yeah, I have a lot of issues, but <laughs> I'm, I'm very orderly and my husband is very disorderly and but he has his things too that he's very strict about that have to be a certain way so I think we it was understandable that we have an autistic child he's like yeah you two people are crazy so you know what do you expect but <laughs> but anyway yeah I'm very I I do tend to be a little rigid in certain things and so it I think the writing part, it's just like, I can just throw it all up in the air and I have the plot. I have, I, I know I'm safe. I've got my scaffolding, but to add the color and to paint and to put the cement here, but put a flower here and whatever, I can do that all day because I've got my scaffolding and I know that makes it safe. And I think that's what it is for my writing for me. In fact, that's the first time I've described it that way, but that really is it. It's like, I've always thought of it more as a foundation, but it really is, it's scaffolding. And then everything in between is you play and you do this and you put, oh yeah. And, and sometimes that changes the scaffolding and I'm okay with that. I, I could, then I know where, it's like, okay, if I change this corner of the scaffolding, it's not going to make the building fall down. And so that's, does that describe it well? <laughs> no, it does. And, and it kind of leads into where I was also wondering, because you have released so many books, but this is the start of a new series. Right. And wondering really, how does that differ then? Because we've talked to authors as they've wrapped up series, but since this is the first book of a new one and you're a plotter, so... I am assuming that there are going to be books about each of the sisters. Yes. Yes. Okay. So good. Good for that confirmation. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I wouldn't, <laughs> that would be a pulling a fast one on my readers. I think if I didn't do that, yep. I was like, now I'm going to write about their cousins. <laughs> you know. <laughs> 
Yeah, I would probably be drummed out of the I'm already historical romance in those business. Following books, I was like, okay, I've got to find out what's going to happen with the lies in here. <laughs> but as a plotter, do you, when you're kicking off that new series, how much of that scaffolding do you already put together for the beginning of um, an entire series, or are you still just really focused on the first book and seeing how that develops? Uh, it depends. Um, with Hellions, I. I, I'm trying to remember, but I'm pretty sure I didn't know how the end was going to be for the series mm -hmm. until I was about halfway through the first book. And then I went, oh, that's what I have to do now. Okay. And uh, so, but I still did not know which pieces would get really you know, revealed in each book. Even when I did um, The Heiresses, that was supposed to be, in my head, that was a four book series. Mm. First book, and then um, I, I had everything set for four books. So I'm writing the third book and they said, well, we want three more books. And I went, no, no, you don't understand. <laughs> the book is ending over here. And they were like, no, no, we want six. It's doing really well. We want six books total. And I was like, oh crap, oh crap. So I put Stoneville in the fourth book. He shows up. All the people who show up in the fourth book are because I realized that I had to have uh, more books and I had to have more possible cousin Michaels than I had because I needed three more books so yeah so then I introduced a bunch of new characters and I thought for sure all my readers would go oh yeah so it's none of them no nobody guessed that nobody I was convinced the world knew the world did not know. And then everybody was disappointed it wasn't Stoneville, which is why I had to start a whole new series with him. So yeah, sometimes I don't think that far ahead. I think a certain amount ahead, but I don't think so far ahead that I, you know, I'm getting some surprise. I'm writing Eliza's book now and I'm getting some surprises in Eliza's book. And uh, it's like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Surprise. <laughs> so as long as I'm getting surprises for me, then, then the book, then I'm okay. You know, um, the middle book is hard. The middle book has been hard. Eliza's book has been hard. I don't think Verity's book is going to be quite as hard, but she jumped into the first book and Eliza's a quieter character. And I always have more trouble writing quieter character characters. I just do. And so I'm finally, I think, finding my footing and um, in the book. And so I feel better. This always happens to me. I'm about halfway through the book, at the halfway point of a book. Right now, I'm almost at two thirds. So I'm firmly have my footing. But at the halfway point of the book, I always go, why did I think this was a good idea? This is stupid. This is never going to work. What was I thinking? I'm going to have to tell my, and I always have this whole doomsday scenario. I'm going to call my publisher and say, this time I've really done it. I sold you a bill of goods. I've got to start over. We're going to do a new series. And sometimes I've even gone to the point of calling my agent and saying, I really think it's a mistake. What if I do this? And it's like something that really throws it into something else. And she'll say, I think what you have is fine. Maybe if you just tweak this. And, and she would say, just tweak this. And I go, Oh, yes, that would solve everything. Thank you. You know, it's like, it's like my head goes to this, the world is ending first, partly because my mom was that way. My mom was a very doomsday woman. Everything was ending. The world was ending. And, and that's not my natural way, but I still have a lot of my mom in me. So I, I go, the world is ending, but, it, and then it turns out it's not. And if I just, 
messed with this little thing and this little thing, it'll all be fine. And so well, since we now all see that you are indeed human, <laughs> something we can all relate to, not the same thing. I want to yeah. transition some into our fresh fiction facts. Okay. These are some quick answers, what comes to the top of your head, um, just some fun insights into okay. various aspects. Okay. What is your favorite writing fuel? Is it food? Is it coffee? Is it coffee? Coffee. Okay. I don't even have to think about that one. Coffee. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm going to have to lower my coffee intake. So I am transitioning to tea. You know, I'm getting older, Kathy. It's a substitute. We understand. Yeah. 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 It's never yeah. going to be coffee. <laughs> Sorry. I still have coffee, just can't have much after a certain time of the day. What do you do to celebrate a new release? Uh, at this point, nothing really. <laughs> I just, I don't, I, um, sometimes I get now what I do celebrate is finishing the writing the book that okay. I do celebrate. I don't really celebrate the release because I'm usually into writing the next book or even a book further down the line. And I'm so focused on that. It's like, oh yeah, I have a book out this week. Oh, well, I should do something. You know, that's, that's kind of how it goes, mm -hmm. but finishing the book pizza because that's my favorite food so I always have to have a pizza my are husband are you a knows. pineapple person or no uh, oh, no 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 never never sorry never <laughs> I mean I like pineapple itself just not on pizza. just not on pizza okay not all right pizza. what luxury pizza. item can you absolutely not live without <laughs> this is gonna sound like answering the first question um uh, Starbucks. Mm. Okay. I, I have tried other coffee houses. I have tried other coffee houses, coffees, but I really prefer my Starbucks iced coffee. And okay. I know that wherever I travel, there will be a Starbucks. Usually. Nowadays, that is very true. <laughs> very yeah. true. I can always be sure I could get my Starbucks iced coffee. And I know that's a look. Uh, it's not as much as a luxury as it used to be because all of them charge a fortune for iced coffee. So my husband always does the figures in his head. But, you know, I can make you iced coffee. And it's like stop it's being the a cheapskate. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I can't think of anything else. Okay. What do you own an absolute ridiculous amount of? Um, what do I own? Absolutely. I, you know, CDs. Still? Yes. Ooh, if they're yeah, all there. Cast your okay. shame there. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Okay. No, I, they're all on my, on my iPod. Not all of them. Cause I can't fit all of them on my iPod. That's how many CDs I have, but I have them, the, the, the computer guy who showed me how to have to do uh, iTunes match, I could kiss him forever because I do iTunes match and I have every single song on my entire library on iTunes yeah. match. So I can, I still can't fit them all on my phone as big as my phone has gotten. I still can't fit them all on my phone, but I can get most of them there. So I, I'm big in music. I, my choice was between music and writing and I decided music took too much practice. So, so with that, who was your favorite one hit wonder uh, I have to pick a favorite I have a lot of one hit wonder favorites um, I'd have to look at my music actually let me think well crash test dummies they weren't I mean they they had a viable album I think they had two hits off their album you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um the problem is there are a lot of single songs I like, but these could be huge artists and I wouldn't know. I just heard the song in, in Starbucks, usually while I'm writing. And I went, oh, I like that song. And then my son introduced me to Beyonce. Mm -hmm. 
he didn't know he introduced me to Beyonce, but he did. His caregiver said, you know, Nick really likes Beyonce. And I went, okay. And then I listened, I, I downloaded it for him. And then I listened to a few and I went, oh, I really like her. And so that was that one. Uh, but one of the songs that he really liked was um, Fancy, which mm. I like. Mm -hmm. So, but I don't know who's the art. Um, I forgot the artist's name, but I don't think she's a one hit wonder. I think she's a still a big star. So, um, but I like the song and I really like that song. And I like Empire. There's a bunch of single songs I like that are not probably one hit wonders if that makes any sense because I just hear the song you're just a fan of all the different types of music then I like all yeah. kinds of music except I don't like jazz I don't really know why. I just don't like jazz okay. I am from New Orleans originally do not like jazz uh, my husband likes jazz but he only likes a certain kind so uh, he likes what he calls smooth jazz that's what he says he likes whatever that means okay and he doesn't like any of the beboppy stuff which is mm -hmm. good because neither mm -hmm. i just don't like jazz at all is there any other kind i don't like i think jazz is only the only one i like everything else i like some things that he's not keen on he did he's older than i am so he doesn't like rap i love rap um I like all kinds of stuff just if it's an interesting song I will I will add it to my iPod which is why it's so big okay who would you want to be stuck in an elevator with do they have to be alive no. I mean do they have to be okay anybody living dead make-believe whatever so Jane Austen of course mm. okay I would ask her a million questions uh second choice would be James Joyce because I really want to know if he meant to write Finnegan's Wake hmm. or if okay. it really he once told somebody that it was a joke that scholars were going to be dissecting for years he just wrote it it made no sense and they would be trying to make sense about of it for a hundred years and he would laugh from beyond the grave so but I think he really was joking I think he took his but I would love to know if he <laughs> seriously wrote a book that he because I don't know too many people have read it my brother tried to read it he was like Deb I'm like yes I know sorry that's my my real name is Deb your real name yeah. <laughs> he was like, now, the following question is more for me what okay. is your favorite thing about New Orleans oh, the food the oh, yeah. food I love the food the food first and then the 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 diversity i i know there's a lot of racism in new orleans but there is also a lot of very casual diversity like i my sister did not want to live in louisiana my sister's um uh husband is uh half black half japanese and they decided that louisiana they just they couldn't do it. There were, you know, it was going to be hard on them and their children and whatever. And that was years ago, you know, she's been married about as long as I have. But, um, but New Orleans was a little island separate from that. And so multi uh, race marriages were not unusual. There's just so much um, uh, interracial marriage. And, and so I love that. I love that I met so many interesting, eccentric people. I love New Orleans. I miss it a lot. But we moved here. I, I live in North Carolina now. And uh, we moved here for my son, who's autistic. Mm -hmm. And he has had a, gotten a lot of benefit out of living here. And so I probably wouldn't move back. But my brother, one of my brothers just moved there. And I'm like, oh. Oh, really? How big is your house? Always again? good to have a reason to go back and visit. <laughs> yes. My college roommate still lives there. So it's always a built-in excuse. Oh, great. There yeah. you go. Yeah. Wonderful. <laughs> well, before we transition into our after hours happy hour, okay. how can our readers stay in touch and follow your future releases? 
Okay, well, I, I'm on um, uh, Facebook, of course, and I have a Facebook page, and I also have uh, Sabrina's Dames and Dukes, which is my Facebook group, which I'm pretty good about, you know, being in there a lot. I hope some of them are even here. Um, and then uh, I have a website still. Yes, very old. Um, I have a website. Uh, you can go there. I have a very active newsletter. I put out a newsletter once a month, and I always have what I call a Regency tidbit, which is something about the Regency that uh, my, my most recent one was, I think, when I discovered that the term fashionista is not far off from a term they used in the Regency, which is fashionist, and it is perfectly Regency. It is straight out of the magazines, which is where I found it, a Regency fashion, you know, uh, magazine. And so that, and let's see what else. I'm on Twitter. I'm on Instagram. I'm not as much on Instagram as, I mean, I like to go on there and look at other people's stuff, but I am a terrible, terrible picture taker. Awful, really bad. I, a, I forget to take the pictures. I'm not visual as much as somebody else. You know how they always ask about your knowing? Do you learn how to, do you know by reading or pictures or what I always click reading if you're going to tell me something I will listen and it will go right this way but if you write it down then I will take all of it in and I'm so I'm not good with pictures so Instagram I am on there and I'm just not as, as good uh with that um but I like Twitter because a lot of people talking. So yeah. as you can tell, I like to talk. <laughs> and then, and Facebook. And then I, I, once you get to TikTok, I'm like movies. Yeah, no, no. Pictures with music. And I can't do that. All of that I can't. <laughs> so no TikTok for me. Maybe one day I'll, I don't know, dip my toe in. But I have a brother who's a movie maker. so. Yes, and he was just up for the Emmys. Uh, yes. Yes. They yes. were up for two Emmys. They didn't win, but we all watched anyway. You can watch it online. He's he kept saying his wife picked a dress and she's her dress like, was I have gorgeous. To have it. I loved her it? dress. I thought yes. it was beautiful. And and he kept saying, honey, this is not like the Emmy Emmys. We are not going to be with any of the stars. Like well, the daytime gonna... Emmys. I mean, it, you've got all the soap opera stuff. Come on. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But she works during the day. So she's not watching daytime. So she was still like, I've got to, I have to have a dress. He was like, you know, this is the editing and those ones. That's what we're up for. But I am convinced that one day he will win an Emmy. I'm keeping my fingers crossed. So as you can tell, we're also very creative in my family. But anyway. And we appreciate you talking with us today and sharing your creative process. And readers can be on the lookout because the latest book, A Duke for Diana, has been released. And we know Eliza's is coming up. Yes. So we'll be on the lookout <laughs> there also. So yes. again, thank you so much for joining us this evening, and we will transition over to our after hours happy hour. Okay.